this time I invite you to stand with me as we join together in our call, for, call to worship. You will find it printed in your board. Come to the Lord who alone is our God. Let us forsake the gods we have worshipped our enemies. Come and bow down before the Lord your Maker. And declare God's wonderful works. Let us indeed declare God's wonderful works in the singing of our hymn, Rock of Ages. Uh, the words are in your bulletin. morning from the book of Exodus chapter 17 verses 1 through 7. From the wilderness of sin the whole congregation of the Israelites journeyed by stages as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim but there was no water for the people to drink. The people quarreled with Moses and said give us water to drink. Moses said to them why do you quarrel with me? Why do you test the Lord? But the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and livestock with thirst? So Moses cried out to the Lord, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. The Lord said to Moses, Go on ahead of the people and take some of the elders of Israel with you. Take in your hand the stamp with which you struck the Nile and go. I will be standing there in front of you on the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. He called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites were and tested the Lord saying, is the Lord among us or not?
special music. <laughs> Not in the book. <coughs> Our gospel today comes from the gospel according to Matthew, verse, uh, chapter 21. We're going to hear verses 23 through 32. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? And Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? they argued with one another. If we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John the Baptist as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we do not know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vineyard today. And the son answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second and said the same. And he answered, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? They said, the first. Jesus said to them, I tell you. The tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. 
For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. The religious authorities, authorities have to ask Jesus how he got his authority. Well, as the saying goes, if you have to ask, you'll never know. They're asking this because of a couple of things that Jesus has done recently. They weren't in our reading today, but here are a couple of things that Jesus has just done. First, he entered Jerusalem to great fanfare, riding on a donkey. And the Pharisees and elders and chief priests, etc., they would have remembered from the scriptures of the Old Testament that this act, uh, entering the city on the donkey, was symbolic of the coming of the Messiah. So that's one thing that Jesus did recently. Then Jesus entered the temple, calmly wove together a whip from willow branches or something, and drove the money changers out. Forget all of the complicated symbolism of this act. We can talk about that another time. All you need to know is that those who were in charge of the temple would certainly have noticed that their main source of income had just been sent home. Now, the chief priests and elders with help from the Sanhedrin, which included some Pharisees and some Sadducees, were supposedly in charge of the temple. They were supposedly the ones who had authority over what happened there. Supposedly. But not actually. When they ask how Jesus got his authority, I, I believe they really want to know. I, I believe they recognize that he actually has what they are supposed to have. But don't really have authority. My friend uh, Joel and I were talking about some ministry initiative that he and I were trying to start. This was years and years ago, way back when I lived in the west suburbs of Cleveland, Ohio. And I believe Joel and I were trying to start a series of outreach uh, events that were targeted toward young people. And at this particular meeting that Joel and I were having, which I think occurred over breakfast, probably at Bob Evans, Joel and I were trying to think of ways we could handle the logistics of this plan. And the problem was, it was just Joel and I. And there was way more to accomplish than two people could accomplish. So, during the course of our meeting, Joel just looked up and looked at the list of all the stuff we had to do, and then looked up at me and said, Jim, you, you uh, well, what he decided was to tell me to tell one of my associates on the church staff, whose name was Brett, to do certain of the tasks that were on our to-do list. And he said, just tell Brett that he needs to do some of this stuff. And I responded that I would ask Brett if he would be willing to help us. And Joel made a face. And then he said, Jim, this is a ministry that you are starting as part of your job as youth minister. Brett is on the youth ministry staff, and you are a mentor to him. Don't you have enough authority in Brett's life that you can just tell him to do this? I don't remember what I said in response to Joel. I do remember that I was a little bit shocked. I mean, everything he said was true. I was the director of the student ministry. The thing we were coming up with was going to be a part of our ministry, which I was in charge of. So I had handpicked Brett to lead the high school portion of our student ministry. And this event was going to be targeted to our high school. And, and more than that, I was actively trying to train Brett for a career in youth ministry, a career in which he did eventually enter, and he is still engaged with it in this day, to this day. And it was also true that Brett regarded me as a mentor. All that was true. And furthermore, Joel was right. I had enough authority in Brett's life that I could have just said, Brett, I need you to do such and such for this event. And he would have done that. So what do you think? In this situation, if you were me, 
And Joel said, can't you just tell Brett to do what we need done? What would you have done? If Jesus were to tell this story as a parable to the chief priests and the elders, how would they answer? Well, so as not to leave you hanging, here's what I did, or rather what I didn't do. I didn't command Brett to do anything. Instead, I told him about the event that we were planning, and I asked him if he would like to be a part of it. And Brett said, sure. We then worked together on getting stuff done, like we always did. Everything that needed to get done, got done. The event happened, it was successful. So successful that we had a whole series of these things. Joel never knew that I hadn't followed his suggestion. He still doesn't know. Please don't tell him. On another level, Joel had real authority in my life. He could have said, Jim, tell Brett to do this stuff. But he didn't do that. Instead, he asked me a question. Now, I didn't do the thing that he suggested in his question. But the thing Joel wanted to accomplish was accomplished. Namely, I successfully recruited Brad to help us with the work. In this case, authority was honored all around without being insisted upon. Now you may think that this is kind of all like sort of tricky. And you're right, because true authority is tricky. You get it by not trying to get it. You keep it by letting go of it. More of it comes to you when you give it away. Or more accurately, more of it is given to you by those to whom you give yourself. A good way to lose authority is to claim it. Joe suggested that I claim my authority over bread. But if I had done that, I would have risked losing that very authority. But maybe not. At least I would have risked um, doing damage to it. That would have had to be repaired later on. The Pharisees, the scribes, and you know, everybody else, all the religious quote-unquote authorities, they had been using authority that they claimed to have to push around the people of Israel. By contrast, Jesus had real authority, true authority, because instead of claiming it, he earned it. Now, the Pharisees were not dumb people. They could see the difference. Matthew told us several chapters before this one that Jesus spoke as one who had authority, unlike the scribes and the Pharisees. That's why they asked Jesus the question which I think is a genuine question. Where did you get this authority? But as I said, if you have to ask, you'll never know. And they don't find out in the story. We don't have to ask, though. Right? Because we already know. The answer to where Jesus got his authority is easy to see when we look at the ministry of Jesus who gave himself away completely, and to whom all authority in heaven and on earth was granted. You can find that very later in the same gospel that we're reading, Matthew. Jesus had true authority because he earned it. Christians are more known today for claiming to be authorities on how everybody else should live their lives and what they should do and shouldn't do and who they should and shouldn't do it with. But you know what? That is exactly how the religious authorities in Jesus' day forfeited whatever authority they may otherwise have had. And it's part of the reason why the church grows less and less relevant as time goes on. People who follow Jesus ought to know and I, I think that in our hearts we do know that authority is earned by us, is given to us 
by the people to whom we give ourselves in love and in service. We know this is true. In a world where authority is often insisted upon by people who think they're supposed to have it, let us, you and me at least, let us be people who earn actual authority with words and works of love. Every day, including this one, is an opportunity to do that. Let's pray. God, if there are people in our lives who see us as some sort of true authority, it is because we have given ourselves away to them in love and in service. We've earned it. And I'm sure that Everyone in this pavilion has examples of that. True authority earned in service and in words and works of love to other people. We pray, God, that we would become more and more that. More and more those who earn true authority with words and words of love. Just like Jesus did. It is in his name that we pray. Amen. <laughs>
we haven't been home since we've been born. But, uh, but 11 pounds. 11 pounds now. She's got that going for her. All right, we will continue to pray for Milo. Thank you, Linda, for sharing that with us. Uh, others? Any others, joys or concerns? Do we have a, a McGrath Keeler up, update? Um, yeah, they're both. Uh, they asked her to stay until November 13th, so okay. they extended her stay. So the cases are still up. They're not um, coming down. Um, the need's not right. decreasing fast enough. So they keep bringing people up. Okay. We will we'll keep praying for them. Anyone else? And let's go before the Lord in prayer. God, we are Christian people. We look to Jesus as the Lord and the Savior. And we also see in Jesus your final word on the at one moment, the atonement. And it is in Jesus that we are made one with God. But as your word makes clear, you have not given up on your people, Israel. And Paul writes in Romans that all of Israel will be saved. And so we look with respect and admiration and most of all, love on our Jewish brothers and sisters as they come to this day, uh, or this coming day, which will begin this evening at sundown, the Day of Atonement. And we pray, God, like them, that we would keep, to our, keep for ourselves an attitude of always looking to make, be remade one with you, to be at one with you, with God, you, Lord Jesus. And we thank you for our Jewish brothers and sisters, and we thank you for this day that they have set aside and which we may celebrate too, or observe too. And we pray always, God, that we would be looking to you and looking to be one with you. And God, we thank you for the successful surgery that Chris had. We rejoice at that, and we continue to pray for her as she recovers from that surgery. We, we pray that her recovery would be uneventful and it would be as quick as possible. That you would add your healing power to all the work, the good work of the doctors and caregivers. And we continue to pray for Myla and we pray the same for her that you would, Lord, continue to assist her on the road toward home. Uh, looking now, it may be another six weeks. Um, if that's what it takes, then that's what it takes. Lord, we do pray that you would speed up that timeline, that uh, Milo would be allowed to go home, um, that, that she would attain the level of uh, sustaining power in herself that would allow her to go home, maybe even before the six weeks happen. We continue to pray for Milo. We rejoice that she has gained weight and that she is uh, continuing to make progress. We pray, God, that that will continue. And, Lord, we lift our sister Esther to you. We love her, and we know you love her, too. And um, moving, regardless of uh, how easy it might seem, moving is always hard. Uh, and so we, we understand that. And we pray, God, that you would uh, move in Esther's life so that uh, the transition would be as smooth as possible. And even though moving is always hard, we pray that you would make it easy uh, and that you would make the transition to be not just um, not just easier, but also a blessing, pleasant, that there would be new friends, uh, new things to do, new things to experience, new people to get to know. 
we thank you, God, for the new neighbors that Esther will have. And we pray for her family as they move through this transition together that you would add a blessing to it. And Lord, we lift Anna and Drew and everybody who is serving with them, them down in Louisiana. Um, it sounds like they're going to be there for another couple of months or a month and a half. And we do pray, God, that um, as Kim has shared with us, the need is not decreasing there, but increasing. And we do pray, God, that you would help them to have the strength to meet the demand uh, of service that is being put before them. And we pray that you would mobilize uh, more people if that's what's needed. Mobilize more resources if that's what's needed. We pray, God, that you would provide for every need that Anna and Drew have. And more importantly, that you would provide for the needs of the people that they are going to serve who have been uh, stricken by natural disaster. Now, there are other natural disasters and also a global pandemic that we're still suffering through. And we pray, God, for your gracious hand to be present in all those places. God, there are so many places that need your healing touch right now. Uh, it seems like everywhere we turn and almost every moment we uh, we hear about a new one or an ongoing crisis somewhere. We pray, God, that you, you would move in the hearts of your people, that we would turn from whatever ways are not your ways and follow you. We thank you, God, that you are already at work in every one of these situations and lives that we have named before you today. And even the ones that we haven't named before you but are on our hearts and minds, you're at work in those situations and in those lives as well. So we lift it all to you in the name of our risen and living Lord Jesus Christ, who prayed, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. service. Uh, once again, in, it is very likely that next week, next Sunday, 1030, we will be meeting in that building over there and not out here. I just want to remind you of that. Uh, receive the benediction. You leave this place, but God does not leave you. God remains with you, working in you, working through you, and being with you. We pray that God will be with you and firmly in the divine hand and offer your hand